Great. So I'm, I'm Scott Podolsky, and I'm thrilled to introduce today's seminar on pandemic history, pandemic future, AIDS, activism, and today's agenda for global equity and public health. We built this around Emily Bass's new book, To End the Plague, America's Fight to Defeat AIDS in Africa, the first comprehensive history of America's investment in fighting global AIDS. I apologize for uh, The book, which I certainly recommend uh, everyone to, to read, examines the multiple and intersecting individuals, activists, patients, families, politicians, clinicians, and combinations of the above, involved in the emergence, development, successes, and challenges of PEPFAR over the past two decades. Emily Bass will speak about her book um, and his examination of PEPFAR. She'll be followed by a panel discussion with Maureen Luba, class of 2023 in the MMSC GHD program, and with Joy Mukherjee, director of our MMSC GHD program, both of them featured in the book, I should say, as they together consider what the history of transnational AIDS activism has accomplished, what remains undone, and what lessons could be applied to present COVID-19 and quote, pandemic preparedness agendas. I'll first introduce our esteemed speaker and panel. And we have spent more than 20 years writing about and working on HIV AIDS in America and East and Southern Africa. Her writing has appeared in numerous books and publications, including Foreign Policy, The Washington Post, The Lancet, Esquire, and N plus one. She's a recipient of a Fulbright Journalism Fellowship and a Martin Duberman Visiting uh, Research Fellowship from the New York Public Library. A lifelong social, uh, social justice activist, Emily has helped create and launch transnational activist coalitions bridging the US, East, and Southern Africa with a focus on securing comprehensive rights-based healthcare for all. And she'll speak first and will be followed by Maureen Luba and Joya Mukherjee. Maureen Luba graduated from the University of Malawi with a bachelor's degree in public administration. She's the Africa Region Advocacy Advisor at AVAC, or the Global Advocacy for HIV Prevention. Um, she helps lead capacity building efforts around strategy development, data analytics, and advocacy with civil society organizations in Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and Malawi. Tanzania <laughs> and Malawi. She has more than 10 years of experience working on HIV treatment and prevention and sexual and reproductive health and rights programs and she's a board member for the International Partnership for Microbicides. We're proud to host her as a member of the MMSC GHD class of 2023, where her thesis work will assess the barriers and facilitators to integrating sexual and reproductive health and rights programs and HIV services in urban and rural public health facilities in Malawi. And finally, Joya Mukherjee is Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Global Health Equity in the Department of Medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital and Associate Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Among many other things, she is the director of our department's Masters of Medical Sciences and Global Health Delivery Program. Since 2000, she has served as the Chief Medical Officer at Partners in Health and has served as an expert consultant for the WHO and multiple ministries of health concerning HIV, TB, health system strengthening, and health workforce development. She's the author of An Introduction to Global Health Delivery and teaches infectious diseases, global health delivery, and human rights to health professionals and students from around the world, um, many of whom are likely on this webinar now. So we'll get started. And Emily Bass will go first, followed by a discussion between her and Maureen Luba and Joya. So I'm proud to start with that, Emily Bass. Thank you so much, Scott. It is an honor to be here today. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be in dialogue. I had the pleasure of being on campus yesterday with this extraordinary cohort of students in the MMSC Global Health Delivery Program and their extraordinary teacher, Dr. Joya Mukherjee, who sent me on my way with a copy of the second edition of her indispensable book, An Introduction to Global Health Delivery, which reading on the Amtrak en route back to New York City last night reminded or perhaps revealed to me that the Latin root of the word solidarity is solidum, solid, whole. I felt within that classroom yesterday, solidarity in all senses, a whole sense of um, engagement and, and optimism with the power and the insight of, of the students and their professor. And so it's really delightful to carry that forward. In this talk today, what I'd like to do is to explore this idea of solidarity and specifically the solidarity-based activism on the part of people living with HIV and their allies that is the subject of my recent book, To End a Plague. I'd like to talk about the results of this activism and to sp focus specifically on the ways in which activists secured and sustained access to power in decision-making spaces. That's the past part of the talk in the title. 
I'd like to then talk and we'll be joined by, by Joy and Maureen and I hope all of you in a look at the ways that this civil society presence and wielding of power, what's sometimes summarized as representation, it's a problematic word in, in, in ways, but interesting to think about, is playing out in the context of pandemic preparedness. But first to the past. The book's subtitle is America's Fight to Defeat AIDS in Africa, but it could as well be transnational activists fight to defeat AIDS inertia in America and around the world. And this is more than semantics. The, those two options reflect in a real sense, foregrounding the activists, foregrounding the government, in a real sense reflects the dynamic, ongoing, incomplete and essential interplay between civil society actors, including, including people most impacted by the pandemics of HIV, tuberculosis and malaria, and the foreign aid mechanisms, specifically the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, launched by George W. Bush in 2003, which is the subject of the book, um, that emerged, both of those things emerged as a result of a direct, as a direct result of a powerful transnational movement led by and for people living with HIV that first forced an end to the collusion between global governments, the US government in particular, the pharmaceutical industry and the World Trade Organization that prioritized patents, profits and intellectual property over the lives of people living with HIV by maintaining artificially high prices for antiretrovirals and actively seeking to block efforts by South Africa, Thailand and other countries to make or import affordable generic versions of medications. And I talk a lot in this book about that, that work um, and with the time that we have, I'm gonna gloss it, although each of these, each of these moments in this transnational activist movement could be um, and should be the subject of seminars and investigations. But what happens um, after um, the work by a broad coalition of bold activists, including scientists, including researchers, including people on this call, is that the prices of the antiretrovirals drop and this leads to this realization that there needs to be a mechanism. There needs to be a way to procure and fund those drugs. PEPFAR has a mytho-heroic narrative that often places George Bush at the podium at the State of the Union, um, launching this, what is still to this day, the largest disease-specific foreign aid program in American history. As I talked about with students um, yesterday, um, where we start a story reveals our ethics it reveals our perspective. So I'd like to start the story. I'm going to read just a few. I'm going to talk and read sort of, uh, you know, intermittently because what is what is the point of writing a book if not to sometimes have it as your as your script? But let's start the story of these mechanisms in a different place. Um, and 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 we're going to follow civil society actors through the development and implementation and engagement with those mechanisms, and then really consider what this history suggests is needed in the present and what is currently happening with representation. Okay, but first, before we, let's step away from the podium in 2003 where George Bush announces uh, um, PEPFAR and, and let's go to um, uh, West Philadelphia, just, just for a moment. To lure people to move to Philadelphia, Paul Davis and his fellow anarchists offered a range of enticements, including a bike, a room in a squat house, six dates, five bucks, and sometimes a spot in whatever band J.D. Davids was currently playing in. Davis himself was ensconced in Knot Squat, a Baltimore Avenue row house with a deep porch whose black whorled pillars were for a time striped with police tape yellow. A bunch of twigs stood in for a banister. The ground floor air was heavy with the smell of cumin and legumes from Mariposa Cooperative up the street. To keep up the steady drumbeat of media outreach. So Davis, J.D. Davids, Asia Russell, are all previously introduced in this book as members of the American wing of the transnational activist movement that post 1996 began to focus on the medical apartheid both within and beyond America's borders that put AIDS drugs in within reach of some people and not in others. So, so the, instead, the drumbeat of media outreach um, refers to that work. To keep up the steady drumbeat of media outreach, the squat had landlines aplenty all ready to jack into computers for late night faxing. In early 2001, as Davis and other Health Gap members continued sending faxes and press releases about drug pricing and profiteering, he realized the movement had to start working on its next demand. Holy shit, he thought, we need another thing. I'm allowed to curse in a Harvard speech if it's in the context of a, someone speaking, right? 
Um, you'll tell me later if not. In the months after the July 2000 Durban AIDS <laughs> conference, the prices of antiretroviral medications had come tumbling down. The media savvy mo activist movement had persuaded the press and the public that price gouging on essential medications was morally unconscionable and that access to AIDS medications was a human right. In late 2000, the Indian drug manufacturer Cipla sought compulsory licensing for six antiretroviral drugs held under patent by major pharmaceutical companies. Those companies responded that they needed more time. When Cipla began to export its versions of the antiretrovirals, lamivudine and zidivudine to Uganda, Glaxo Welcome dispatched a letter telling the company to cease and desist, writing, quote, intellectual property protection is essential to sustain the investment needed for discovery and development of new treatments for HIV AIDS and other diseases affecting the developing world. So even though, e even though there are these barriers, even though there is this resistance, CIPLA doesn't stop, the prices come down. In February, 2001, the company announces that it would make and sell antiretrovirals for less than a dollar per day. And that was when Davis and others realized that the world would need a thing, right? As he puts it, that would buy and distribute the cheap medications. Sitting around in Philly, we did some cursory Alta Vista searches. That's a search engine some of us may remember, um, just like some of us may remember faxing things from our computers. And if you don't, I, I can tell you about it afterwards. Um, we did some cursory Alta Vista searches and realized no one was set up to pay for the AIDS drugs, Davis recalled, naming the search engine popular at the time. So there's this exploration, right? What is gonna pay for, what is gonna procure and pay for these AIDS medications and what should it look like? What should foreign aid look like at this moment where we are also in the midst of Jubilee 2000 a debt relief focused campaign. We're in the midst of anti-globalization. A really powerful movement is afoot and securing not just the AIDS drugs, but the financing for these programs, financing to buy them, but that also put them into, into functioning programs um, is very much in play. And many groups are part of it, right? So I'm gonna just put some other folks into the room at the moment. The activists were not alone in their thinking. At the 2000 International AIDS Conference in Durban, economist Jeffrey Sachs, then at Harvard University, publicly estimated that the world needed to spend 10 billion to 20 billion a year to address the stark divide between rich and poor when it came to global health. He too advanced a call for a global fund, which Davis and others had also been, been um, shopping around both to the UN and on the Hill a global fund to fight not only AIDS, but tuberculosis and malaria, intertwined diseases of poverty. These monies could not go for prevention alone. Antiretroviral treatment was critical, Sachs argued. More than 100 of his Harvard colleagues agreed and in April 2001 published con the consensus statement on antiretroviral treatment for AIDS in poor countries. By the time the Harvard faculty endorsed AIDS drugs for Africa, discussions about where such a fund would sit and who might run it were well advanced. Carol Bellamy, head of UNICEF, wrote a New York Times editorial proposing that her agency provide the support. When Davis forwarded Bellamy's proposal to a treatment-focused listserv in April 2001, he referenced health gaps inside outside game. We are on Capitol Hill working quietly to build support. Health gap for those who are not familiar, is, is the group, one of the groups that is, was a nexus of the American um, based transnational activism looking for global equity and access to AIDS medications, and it exists to this day. Um, US support was important, but it was also essential to keep the government's hands off the steering wheel. At the top of his list of four concerns, Davis wrote, the program must be multilateral. A US based or directed program will meet with failure in the international community of nations and funders and would be poorly designed. He signed off his email with the admonishment, we do not, that's in all caps, want this program designed by the Bush administration or the US Congress. So of course we know that people don't listen to Paul Davis. Well, people do listen to Paul Davis all the time, but in, in this instance, this, this um, admonishment, we do not want the US um, to create its own mechanism to run this um, is not in fact what happens. What, what happens instead in this, we need another thing moment is that the proposal for the global fund is advanced and it is designed in a way that foreign aid and foreign aid for global health has not been designed in the past. So it is really um, looking at the failure of top-down donor-driven agendas for health and development and saying, let's create a multilateral fund where countries come to that fund with proposals, those proposals must reflect the input for a range of stakeholders, not just governments. And the funding will be allocated according to what the countries and the, their citizens I, from different sectors identify as needs. 
So one of the characters, one of the activists in this book talks about is a sort of a post neoliberal dream of what might be possible. The US government is also very interested in taking substantial action on AIDS. This is the George Bush, George W. Bush first term administration um, and do not want to invest in a multilateral, um, but they do want to do something really big. Um, and that and that some and I there's far more in the book. So we're, we're just moving through some of this. Um, at lightning speed, but the 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 movement, what I want to highlight and I want to also name and express gratitude to those, the Harvard faculty then and now who stood for this, who stood for justice, who called for this fund. The US government is impelled to propose its own solution because there is the proposal of the Global Fund and because the Global Fund comes into existence, right? And there is momentum. And so you have a call and response that's happening and the response from the US government, which is this moment at the podium that we just backed up from and went to the anarchist Philly row houses to complicate that narrative is of course PEPFAR, which George Bush launches in 2003. Um, it is the largest disease specific foreign aid investment in history. It has been compared by um, members of Congress and others to the Marshall Plan in terms of its effectiveness. And it and the Global Fund both fundamentally change the way that AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria are um, approached, funded, programmed for around the world. Um, and, and that change reflects or is often encapsulated, particularly with PEPFAR, as a government initiated endeavor. And, and more specifically, quite often, it's an endeavor that is linked to Bush. It is Bush's legacy, right? And so we lose Paul Davis. We lose the transnational activists who actually brought the prices down and impelled the action. We lose the interplay between Global Fund, a multilateral, and the US response, which is a bilateral. And we lose then, I would argue, in many accounts and many assessments of what has happened with this foreign aid to date around global aids, we lose the persistent, unceasing presence of people living with HIV and their allies within these mechanisms, demanding power, obtaining power, and using that power then to influence policies, programs, and budgets in a pandemic response. And this is what's interesting to me today and where we're going, right, is to look back at the past this pre and this ongoing present, the precedent for embedded activism within foreign aid mechanisms and governance structures influencing pandemic responses to ask what happened and what does this tell us about what should happen for pandemic preparedness efforts, which are very much being discussed today. So I can talk to you about this certainly, um, but I think it is more interesting in a way to follow the path of somebody who lived through this, right? Um, and that's Lillian Mareko. So we're gonna do another little journey in the book. Lillian Mareko is the, right now is the leader of um, the International Coalition of Women Living with HIV in East and Southern Africa. Um, she's an activist, she's a friend, she's a comrade. Um, to many of us. Um, and she's also somebody who, who generously, um, who I've collaborated with in one way or another for, um, for uh, 14 years, I would say, um, and who generously worked with me to, um, to, to fill in her story um, prior to when I met her. Um, and so we're gonna, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use Lillian's story in the book in a way to, um, to try to bring to light what the journey through these different forms of representation within these spaces look like. And, and again, to sort of return to these questions of what is possible, what should we be seeking? So let's, let's meet Lillian. Lillian Moreco is a majestic woman with a high forehead and searching eyes. She received her own HIV diagnosis on the day that her husband, a biochemist who'd previously tested positive, died. In 1998, she found a business card for the major, this is Major Ruranga, 
who had started the night who had started the National Guidance and Empowerment Network for people living with HIV in Uganda and was an early publicly a uh, public figure living with HIV and demanding government action um, and fighting against stigma. So NGEN, which he started, became a place that, a, a center that people gravitated towards who wanted to take action and who were looking for community. So Moreko found her business card for the major among her late husband's possessions and she'd gone to find him. I was young, I didn't know what to do, she recalled. Major Ruranga told her about his network. Moreko went to the meetings and found the group well-established with meetings and field work every weekend, but she was used to arriving when work was already underway. I was good at catching up and doing things, so it was easy to get in and be accepted and start facilitating. The first born of seven children, Moreko grew up in the western part of the country, reared by an expansive garrulous father and a strict hardworking mother. Years later, she and her sister still laughed about the time her father had gotten off a bus from his job on a plantation with a parcel of fish, but had given all of them away to neighbors by the time he got home. In contrast, her mother was no nonsense. If a child went to school on a day that she was needed to help at home or in the garden, she didn't eat that night. It was very rare that I would go to school very early in the morning, she'd later recall. Mareko was bright enough that she excelled in school even when she arrived halfway through the day. On the days Mareko arrived on time, she still missed lessons when she left to cook the teacher's lunch, an agreement they'd made since her family could not manage their fees. She earned a scholarship and arrived at a Catholic boarding school without the well-stocked metal trunks of her wealthier fellow students. I was the only one with the wood suitcase in the whole school. So I, I've introduced a couple of other characters by this time. Millie Katana, Lillian Moreco, and Sissy all had mothers who'd worked hard and enjoyed less education than them. The three young women had gone on from secondary school to higher education. Moreco had studied to be a teacher as Museveni moved into the state house. They lived through the violence, instability, and terror of the regimes that had come before his ascent to power. They started their professional lives with high expectations and invested in doing whatever they could to prevent the country from devolving again into violence. None of them had planned on getting involved in a new war, but when the viral foe emerged, they hadn't had a choice. So why, why am I bothering to give you Moreko's background? Why, why does this happen in the book? Why, why do we bring this up? Because um, Lillian and some of the other activists described here are, are middle class, they're educated, they are Africans living with HIV, but they are not the tropes that we are um, so often fed and we so often see and we know to be inaccurate of impoverished, illiterate, um, uh, needing empowerment, which I'll come back to this word, I'll come back to you, needing capacity building. So we, we I'm putting in biography here because I want to talk about the ways in which representation um, erases capacity, right? Um, in the ways that people living on pandemic front lines have both lived experience and what we in, in sort of normative power structures recognize as the academic credentials. So, so that's sort of a little bit of that intervention, right? So Lillian gets involved within Jen. Okay, and, and she gets a job and, and we're just moving through time here. So we were just in, um, in 1998 um, and now it's a few years later um, and she and other activists um, are organizing and they're organizing committees to figure out with scant money, resources from a program called AIDS SETI um, that was founded in part by, by um, Hans Binswanger who was a WHO economist himself living with HIV, who was trying to figure out how to get some AIDS drugs to people in Africa before there were these programs. And the groups would organize, like Engine would self-organize to figure out who among them should get the medications, right? Um, so treatment rationing and a committee deciding. So in Uganda in the years, I'm just gonna read Lillian's recollection of that time. In Uganda in the years before PEPFAR and the Global Fund arrived, members of NGEN gathered resources and donations to support a handful of their members. Lillian Moreko never forgot one meeting. We had, quote, medicine for only seven people and everyone and everybody wanted to be on treatment. But that don't, at that moment, we were like, no, you know what? It can only be these people. Everyone concurred on the same names. Mareko herself had been able to start ART after her supervisor at an AIDS organization wrote a budget line for her treatment into a grant from the British government, arguing that if his staffer wasn't alive, they couldn't deliver the project. She recalled the decision about the seven slots being unanimous and easy. I don't remember anybody complaining. 
She told me this story beneath the shade of a drooping tree on the lawn of her home in a village outside Kampala. The house was filled with children, relatives, and an orderly home. It was the sort of, quote, normal life that had seemed out of reach when she was first diagnosed. But there was something about the caring that suffused those days that stayed with her. Where did that moment go, she asked. And we were, this conversation happened in 2019. And at this point, Lillian is leading ICW East Africa. She is working on task forces in the Ugandan government. She is very instrumental in the civil society engagement in PEPFAR that I'll talk about in just a moment. And, there's a, and she's re reflecting on a time when her life depended on a budget line and a DFID grant. And you're choosing from a room full of people, the seven people who are gonna get treatment. And she's, and there's a real sense of not nostalgia and not wistfulness, but, but a, a memory of, and a reaching back towards what I would say again, is this sense of solidarity, this sense of connectedness, and this sense of what was happening when people most impacted by pandemics were also coming up with the solutions. And I was struck by that, um, and also struck by the ways in which, in spite of this sense of no longer being the groups coming up with the solutions in most cases, because when major foreign aid arrives, it arrives with solutions proposed for the most part by the funders, even within the context of the global fund, there's a fight to have the programs reflect the priorities. But all of these actors who survived, all of these activists who survived, in spite of the, the sense in which the system, the state, the mechanisms, shifted the decision-making power, decided to remain engaged. They remained engaged and they remained um, in the spaces where they could claim power and influence decisions. And, and one of the things that the book talks about um, is what that looked like in, in the PEPFAR space specifically, right? And PEP, this, this happened over time. PEPFAR, when it started, did not share its plans. Um, you know, there, there might be a PowerPoint presentation that emerged out of um, the embassy or that was shown to the Ministry of Health at a certain point, but the PEPFAR plan for the country was not made with the agency, the, the country level actors, except as funds recipients, and it certainly wasn't made with civil society. But civil society, people living with HIV and their allies, including Lillian, okay, so we're now um, we were, we're now about 15 years after this moment, this meeting where those seven people are selected, Lillian and many other people, including Maureen Luba, um, including um, Health Gaps, Maureen Malanga, who's a Kenyan, Chamanora Mashoka, who's a Zimbabwean, African-based AIDS activists begin to say to the PEPFAR teams in country, we'd like to see your plans. And they write letters and they say no. And they say, no, we'd really like to see your plans. And they write letters and they say no. And the U.S. allies, whose taxpayer money is paying for these programs also begin talking to the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator saying, you really you should really share your plans. And the answer is no, until it isn't, right? And, and this is when we think about long durée, long-term civil society activist engagement with pandemic responses, these, these engagements with the system are sometimes not seen as activism. They're certainly not street protests, although those are also happening, but they're essential for continuing to demand and then utilize spaces, the, the access to spaces of power about policy, um, budgets, service delivery models. And so what eventually happens because of this persistence, because of this incessant um, request and this demand that civil society be engaged is that civil society is given a seat at a table and they are invited initially to review and consider the PEPFAR plans. And at first it's, it's kind of overwhelming. I'm gonna read a little bit about that, right? Um, and this happens in 2014, 2015, which is also when um, Ambassador Burks um, helms the program. The shift happens under Ambassador Eric Goosby, but it's really implemented under um, Ambassador Deborah Burks, who is also taking the program into an extremely data and target driven um, era. And so what the activists are seeing, what we are seeing are these enormous Excel spreadsheets, just giant Excel spreadsheets or PowerPoint presentations that are filled with acronyms, the PEPFAR indicators, um, which are 
very, very light on vowels and very hard to pronounce. Um, and there's no translation of what these things are. And the activists have fought to get access to this. And this is just a little bit about, about what that's like, right? Even before the activists had secured invitations to the country planning meetings, they'd secured sections of PEPFAR planning documents and started studying up on the budget codes and indicators that populated these tables from data land, is what I call it. And then Richard Lucimbo, who is one of the Ugandan activists who works with Lillian, um, he, he is, um, at, at this point in the story, he's with Smug, Sectional Minorities Uganda, and he's talking about being invited to these presentations and having PEPFAR coordinators present it. He says, it was like they were at a dress rehearsal, like they, we weren't even there. The sense of being presented to, as though you're not there, the, the presumption that this audience is, is so unlikely to absorb what's happening that, that it's almost as though you're not there, right? He listened to Asia Russell, so our health gap activist from, from West Philly, right? She's now living in Uganda. They watched Lillian, he watched Lillian Moreko and Kenneth Moyhonge, is another activist. They'd come to call themselves a triumvirate in action. He started printing out the slides at home, making notes, raising his hand when the lights went up. There were no stupid questions. And so there's this engagement, there's this demand to be present and not just be present as a person living with HIV, to be counted, to give remarks at the end, which is, if we look at the recent Biden COVID summit, there was a person impacted by COVID. It's often, it's one of these little tricks to just look at where that person, where that so-called civil society representative is in the program. And if they're the last speaker, there's probably something wrong, right? Um, in my view. So I'm just, I, I have a few more moments and we're gonna turn it over. We're gonna open it up for, for discussion. Um, but we're gonna end in 2019 um, because by 2019, by 2020, it's not a dress rehearsal anymore. A powerful collection of AIDS activists, including Maureen Luba, including the triumvirate, including Maureen Malanga, Chaminora Mashoka, David Kamkwamba, um, it's a legion. It's Lillian Mareko, okay? And it's their US allies. It's myself, it's Asia Russell, it's Matt Kavanaugh, it's Brian Honorman. So it's gr a group of civil society has demanded access to and obtained access to the PEPFAR regional planning meetings where we're pouring over the data that PEPFAR shares and, we've tra and we're learning how together to split the work, who can translate the acronyms, who can do the analysis of the data that they share, who can send teams out into the field like Maureen does. Maureen goes to clinics and helps teams figure out how to go to clinics and do community-based monitoring. Let's see for ourselves what's happening. Let's challenge the indicators with our own stories, right? And bring all of that to these planning meetings and influence budgets, policies, service delivery models, and targets, which again is this issue of what is the role? What can we look at? This isn't history, this is ongoing for civil society engagement in pandemic preparedness. So I'm just really, really briefly, just because I love it. I love these people and it's a chance to, to, to share that love. In the PEPFAR planning rooms, we're now in 2019. I watched Maureen Malanga from Health Gap brace her hand on the table before she spoke like a sprinter taking her mark. While in the room next door, my indefatigable friend and colleague Maureen Luba flipped pages in her native Malawi's data and plans pointing out discrepancies and advancing demands with a patient stubbornness that dispensed with her country's proclaimed collegiality. No more Malawi nice, she'd say. In the, and you know, if Maureen says that to you, you should really buckle up. In the Ugandan room, a government representative had once demanded that Margaret Happy, it's another Ugandan activist, come and stand at the front of the room to apologize for claiming correctly that there were major stockouts. Ken Moihange had stood with her. No one took the heat alone. Felix Mwanza, this is from Zambia, wouldn't come back after the year he won the treatment slot. So he fought a battle and paid for it by being blacklisted by PEPFAR. There was, he said, bad blood between him and the PEPFAR team, but new Zambian advocates arrived and took up the work of pushing for greater ambition. Finding Lillian Moreko in the hall, she'd raise a hand and slap it into mine. My dear, these people, she'd say and burst out laughing. These people didn't stand a chance against her as long as they let her in the room. And that was why in spite of everything, I loved Data Land. For one or two weeks every year, it was home to the most powerful and effective activists I'd ever seen. So there's Lillian, okay? And I'm one, we're gonna see Lillian one more time in 2020. And then we're gonna move to the present. 
It's like we're back to the beginning again, Lillian Moreco said one day in June 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic was well underway. In the earliest days of the AIDS epidemic, when there had been no drugs in the clinics and people with the virus had often been shunned by their families, women like Moreco, Yvette Raphael, Millie Katana, and so many others had gone door to door, seeing who needed food, care, or support. They'd helped comrades survive and received the same comfort when they themselves faltered. That local web of community-based care had been eroded as funding went to pills in the clinics that provided them. Now the life and death impact of devaluing community-based work was abundantly clear. With the COVID-19 lockdowns, people were back in their homes, often without food or income. Gender-based violence was rising as were unplanned pregnancy rates. No clinic-based service would, could help. Moreko went to the Ugandan Ministry of Health and picked up a sticker that allowed her to drive her vehicle during lockdown. The virus that had once been a source of stigma now afforded stature. She packed her car with food and went to see women living with HIV. She was back at the beginning again. So the, the issue is we can't be back at the beginning. We can't afford to be back at the beginning when it comes to representation, civil society representation in the spaces where decisions about planning budgets, policies and approaches are made. And, and I hope that that, that that sort of movement through time with Lillian from, from a solidarity based community led response that was inadequate to a decision to cooperate, to collaborate, to be within rooms um, in solidarity, but also in dialogue, tension, um, and activist relationship with the government, with foreign aid mechanisms. I hope that, that's, that, that, that that arc, and the reason I shared it with you is clear because the question is, what do we do now and what is happening right now? And just briefly, be, we cannot be back to the beginning. And yet, if we look at what is being discussed and proposed right now in terms of civil society representation in the spaces where discussions of pandemic preparedness are taking place, we are indeed not even back to the beginning, but, but in, some, in some ahistorical realm where some of these decisions, some of the recognition of the impact of including people most impacted by pandemics it isn't registering. So I just wanna share a few things with you. I've been tracking this as it's evolved. Most recently, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board's annual report listed, quote, empower communities ensure engagement of civil society in the private sector as, and I just love that, civil society and the private sector. It's an interesting pairing. It's one of the, it's top six priority solutions, okay? Um, it's entirely reasonable in its syntax, in the sinew of its verbs, in the strange conjunction of civil society and private sector, it sounds alarms. Empowerment has for years been a part of the lexicon of colonized global health, suggesting that skills and resilience need to be allocated to people who are through the very fact of their survival, far more powerful than the average privileged citizen of the global north. Okay, they also, and this is the point about lifting up the middle-class educated people living with HIV, the military, uh, the retired military general who started the activist movement, they, and these are not people who need to be empowered. I love this empowerment programming is explicitly depoliticizing, obscuring women's relationships to power in the state, wrote the authors of Emissaries of Empowerment, a caustic 2018 survey. So you have this word resurfacing. Okay, there's the matter of ensuring representation. Services do as a perennial talking point in working groups and breakout rooms. Opting for ensure means leaving the doing to others. There's peculiarities that flourish. In September, the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development offered its recommendations for 53 countries in the WHO European region. The commission advised, and this is a quote, countries identify and target those who lead precarious or impoverished lives and tackle societal distrust to improve social cohesion, cohesion including by setting quotas for female representation in public bodies with drafting and implementing policies. Again, you know, it's a, it's perhaps it's not back to the beginning, but it's, it's though these lessons are refracted through, through a strange and dangerous mirror. I am all for female representation, but the idea that female representation stands for is a cipher for people leading precarious or impoverished lives, I would argue is in its own way perniciously sexist. Female representation could cl include Sarah Palin, it could include Margaret Thatcher. I mean, I, you know, I don't need to list people and, and I don't need to get political, but I think you can see the point that in the flailing for 
some kind of guidance about who should be represented, we are seeing extremely strange language, okay? And it's not merely lack of ex inclusion, it's active exclusion. According to the modalities established by the WHO, non-state actors are unable to attend or speak at open sessions of the working group that was put together to discuss the pandemic treaty, right? Which is gonna be discussed later this month. They can provide inputs via an electronic portal an open hearing or a segment of a session. In the run up to the discussion of the treaty, um, civil society groups that I've, I've been listening in on and, and, and speaking to, they wax nostalgic about the organized civil society approach for engaging with UN high level meetings and special sessions, which is itself fairly bureaucratized and really um, tilted towards the kinds of groups that have internet bandwidth, um, the ability to really engage with bureaucratic processes. So that's where we are at the moment. And finally, a recent um, Center for Global Development blog recommended as it's looking at inclusion, independent civil society voices from the health security sector. And I wanna flag that because one of the things that happened when George Bush launches PEPFAR is what Andrew Lakoff, social scientist in theory, calls a conceptual mutation. It's when a virus, when a pathogen undergoes a mutation from being a security threat to a humanitarian issue. Bush paints PEPFAR as a work of mercy, even though at a certain point AIDS was such a security threat that one of Reagan's security advisors said, we should stop giving aid to Africa because civilizations were gonna collapse due to the pandemic there. So let's just not invest there, right? It's the black plague and it's, it's, so, it's so unstoppable that we better cut our losses and let civil, civilization collapse, okay? We have a security moment and the virus is conceptually mutated into a humanitarian issue. It is a false dichotomy and it is reflected in the agendas for these preparedness groups the dichotomy between what is humanitarian and what is health security. And what we are seeing, and perhaps one of the barriers, one of the disincentives for engaging in these spaces is in fact that these agendas advance a false dichotomy. They do not speak to the lived realities and the solidarity-based agendas that we I just talked about. So in my final moment, because one should offer some recommendations, some sense of what might happen, consider with these, um, with these, these present interventions, these present offerings, these present statements and recommendations, we are filled with recommendations and we're placed about engagement in these mechanisms for future pandemic preparedness. Replace empowerment with funding, okay? A funding window to support civil society engagement with the array of negotiations, panels and processes centered on pandemic preparedness. That's one thing. Replace ensure engagement with require representation I can't tell you what it looks like in any given country to have people most impacted by and at risk of pandemic threats, but there are ways to define those populations. You can require that. I would rebuke the dichotomy between health security and humanitarianism, recognize relevant expertise, and, and I hesitate to say this because my comrades living with HIV and working on these front lines are exhausted, traumatized, overwhelmed, and angry right now because we are losing ground in those pandemics. Nevertheless, recognize the relevant expertise and where it is feasible, safe and functional, draw on AIDS activists and climate activists to be those representatives rather than talking about empowering or for some reason adding quotas of females of, of undefined levels of expertise. So uh, that's where I'm gonna leave it. And, and, and what I wanna do now is, is turn to Joya and Maureen um, and, and, and have a conversation um, about what representation looks like. What have we learned and, and where do we need to go um, today? And I really just thank you. Thank you for the chance to share my thoughts. Um, and again, thank you for the chance to be in dialogue and to bring some of these people who have really given me the, the opportunity um, to, to learn, to be a witness and to be in solidarity, to bring them to you today. Um, Maureen, I might, I might want to start with you. So you've been doing, you're continuing to do civil society work, you're leading coalitions, you're also um, thinking through this and thinking through the structural frameworks, um, you know, in a brilliant, expansive way um, uh, with your cohort. That was clear to me yesterday. Um, in what ways does the representation that we've secured, that you've secured, um, in what ways can it be adapted? In what, in what is it under threat? What, what do you feel like we should be thinking about? 
Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. I mean, it's been, it's been an honor working with you and learning so much uh, from you. Um, and thanks for that comprehensive uh, uh, history of what, uh, you know, the AIDS activism, especially the civil, uh, the law of civil society, of civil society representation has actually looked like. I think I would try to kind of like hone in on what, you know, uh, civil society national representation has kind of like looked like. I would try to move away from the global perspective, but rather national. And what we have seen in the AIDS, um, in the AIDS uh, response, but also what we are seeing, some of the resources that we can learn from there, but also what we are seeing in the COVID-19 uh, response. Um, I think, it's 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 a known fact that you know civil society you know learning from just from the previous pandemics civil society uh, organizations have always played a very very critical role right you know be it supporting national governments um you know efforts to mitigate the social economic and health you know impacts of different pandemics um and uh, i think they have also been instrumental of course in holding governments Right, or donors accountable to make sure that you know the policies and the services that are being delivered or developed rather responds to the pandemics and that they are inclusive and that they do not bring any harm right to the communities that they are in, intended. Um, and uh, I think for communities, for them, when they think about a civil society, right, they think of you know civil society as a trusted partner, right, as a source of you know valuable information, uh, you know, as a, as a defender of human rights, especially when you think about marginalized groups in the HIV realm, when you think about marginalized group, you know, key populations, adolescent girls and, and, and young women. Um, but they've also been, you know, very critical role in, you know, safeguarding, uh, you know, misuse of resources, of collapsion. I think this is something, you know, that's inevitable. That's something that we have actually seen. Um, and uh, I think in this regard, we've learned so much from the AIDS response and the critical role that civil society can play. Um, and I think one thing that, you know, the AIDS response has actually taught us, you know, is the importance of putting communities, right, at the center. I like the way you said it, Emily, that, you know, those communities can be defined, right? Um, and why do we say communities should be put at the center? It's because communities know better, right, their challenges than any, and anyone else. Um, and uh, I, I think we have actually seen, you know, in the AIDS, uh, in the AIDS uh, response, the importance of engaging communities at all levels from research right when you talk from research design to implementation of you know hiv prevention tools hiv prevention treatment and just talking about research i think with time you know there was a time when when you know when research was being done there was very minimal right you know engagement with communities you know because maybe you know um scientists would think communities would not understand the science, right? But I think with time, what, you know, researchers and scientists have learned is that communities are not dumb, right? Uh, you know, they're not dumb. They do understand the science as long as you put it in a language that they can understand. And that's where, you know, the whole idea of having community advisory boards, you know, that can provide input into, you know, different research processes. That's something that has been robust in the HIV response. It's something that we have seen. We are, and, I think this is something that we yet to see, right? In the COVID response, I haven't seen much of that, at least if I missed that, but I think I haven't seen that level of engagement, of engaging community. Um, and um, I think with AIDS, uh, the AIDS response, again, we have also learned the importance, right? Of, you know, civil society, especially at national level, but civil society representation in key national decision-making processes, right? Which has been a game changer for the HIV response, you know, from national technical working groups to district or provincial level, you know, coordinating uh, mechanism. I think that has been really instrumental, something that we have learned as very critical in the HIV response. And uh, um, I think, to what you said, Emily, to say, you know, those committees can be defined. I think with the AIDS response, we have also, you know, I feel like we've done a better job in identifying which are the communities and the, you know, geographical communities that are impacted or the groups that are impacted most, you know, uh, by, uh, you know, the AIDS pandemic and making sure that we are giving them the voice, you know, and response uh, and, and the space as well. You know, for example, key populations, adolescent girls and young women, um, yeah, and I think we have also learned that communities are experts too, right? Right? Uh, you know, they can you know provide support in delivering services. I think we have heard about HIV expert clients, right? Uh, to say they are not always on the receiving end, but they can also provide support. And they've been, for example, expert clients have been instrumental uh, in supporting with that uh, treatment and healing. And I think uh, you know uh, to some extent also with uh, you know with. Uh, the AIDS uh, movement, the AIDS response, we have actually seen the, the importance of identifying the right messenger for different types of information. What I mean by this, you know, I think we have learned, you know, you know, that sometimes 
you know, maybe health professionals or health care workers may not always be the right messenger, right, you know, uh, to provide certain information to communities, especially when the trust, you know, when the trust is eroded, you know, for whatever reason. Um, and we have seen, you know, how sometimes communities have looked up to people that they regard as community champions, right? Um, and it's not wrong, I think, as long as we make sure that those community champions, right, um, you know, have the, 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 adequate, the right information. And I'm saying this, I think I'll talk about misinformation later, I think, which is, uh, which is something that I think we have all struggled with. Uh, but I think also I just wanted to mention that the AIDS activism movement has also been impacted by COVID, right? I think Emily talked about that, uh, you know, like moving to online uh, platforms, you know, we know with restrictions to gathering, you know, a lot of staff, a lot of meetings are not, are now happening virtually online, which is tough. Uh, I think uh, it can be tough because it's, you know, online meetings, you know, can be less engaging and you, you don't, you know, fully, you know, or, or utilize, you know, all the, you know, the activist tasks. It doesn't provide opportunity to fully utilize all the, the activism tactics that we are all, we've all been used to and that we have applied in the AIDS response. We have seen a lot of conferences happening online, sometimes with little time for engagement. We don't even have a chance to do our protest, our small protest that we normally do when you gather in conferences. And also, you know, sometimes when you're in those conferences, you always have the, these side meetings with, you know, key policy makers, you know, donors, you know, that, you know, have actually yielded to a lot of change, right, uh, in the, in the uh, in the HIV uh, response. And we also know that, you know, with online platforms, there are some countries where, you know, some form of online participation is restricted and controlled by the state, right? And, uh, you know, there's also, of course, limited access uh, due to different levels of digital literacy. And I'm saying this because sometimes when you say, oh, everything has now moved online, you know, we, we forget that, you know, everything has moved online through social media. We forget that. It's easy to forget that, you know, there are other people that do not have access to those platforms, like Emily said. Yeah, so now uh, talking about what are we seeing, right, in the COVID, in the COVID response, how does, uh, you know, community representation look like or civil society representation look like in the COVID response? Um, I think I would say like civil society have continued to play their critical role, right, in the COVID uh, response. They haven't put down their tools, right? They have continued to move who they are, you know, defenders of human rights and plan trying, you know, responders. I think we have seen a lot of that uh, and um, uh, with the COVID as well, but also we have seen, you know, civil society stepping in to provide essential supplies, you know, like uh, food, you know, um, you know, healthy care, you know, PPE, I think like Emily said about like what uh, Lillian, you know, has been doing in Uganda, you know, providing, uh, you know, uh, those supplies to people living with HIV. And um, I think to some extent in other few countries, we have seen at risk inclusion of civil society in national, you know, COVID task force, because there have been a lot of task force that have been, you know, uh, kind of created uh, to guide the response, the COVID response in, in, in a number of countries. Uh, but also I think the critical role that, you know, civil society have played is being the hub, right, of, uh, you know, disseminating accurate information, which I'll talk about later again. But we have also seen how civil society are being excluded, right, in national spaces, in different spaces, and other. And uh, we're continuing seeing how, you know, government, you know, sometimes, you know, they, they've been developing these national strategic policies or national strategies on how to respond to the COVID response without really, you know, uh, providing or engaging civil society, giving civil society a chance to provide um, input into that process. Like, for example, with the implementation or enforcement of the curfews and the lockdowns, civil society were not fully engaged, right, in um, coming up with those decisions. And it had a lot of unintended consequences, especially uh, um, on the African continent. I think we saw that a lot of uh, a lot of that. And, you know, we also saw a lot of police brutality, right, as a punishment for those that couldn't, you know, or who breached, you know, the, the images regulations. And civil society, of course, did their best to, you know, put to put against that. But we have also seen surprisingly how, you know, civil society all of a sudden, you know, have been seen as competitors for resources, right, you know, by the state and not, uh, or by the governments, right, and not as collaborators. Uh, and then in some cases we have seen how, you know, you know, roles or activities that are supposed to be implemented, you know, by civil society are now being implemented by the government, right, which is a missed opportunity because civil society, have the, you know, they have got the expertise and the context and the understanding of the, 
of the communities that they work in. And uh, I think, like I said earlier on, one of the things that we've kind of like struggled with in this COVID pandemic is uh, misinformation. Uh, and I think a critical approach to misinformation is, you know, to better understand, right, how information is flowing on the ground. I think it's very, very critical. And providing, you know, that dialect education outreach to local communities after understanding how the information is, 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 is flowing. Uh, but also I think with this misinformation, it's always important to understand exactly what kind of information you know is being spread? Who is spreading that information? Right? What channels are being used, right, to uh, to spread uh, to kind of like spread that information? And I think having that kind of analysis is critical, um, you know, to understand like what are the unique dynamics, you know, at play. Especially, you know, when you think of those places, you know, that have got you know history, uh, a history of you know pre-existing, you know, uh, political or uh, you know and other tensions. Um, and this is a law, you know, civil society, you know, can play a very critical role in bridging the gap, that information gap, given that they know their context and their communities very well. Yet what we have seen is that, you know, governments and other stakeholders haven't yet fully utilized, you know, you know, that knowledge and expertise. And because civil society and communities have actually been left out, you know, like I've just said, I think the there's been a, a missed opportunity, right, you know, to tap into the knowledge, right, the experience that civil societies have, you know, in fighting many pandemics, not just, you know, COVID, but HIV and many other pandemics as well. So let me leave it there, Amy, but I think that's what I've been thinking, like, I, I was, I've been trying kind of like to reflect on, okay, what have we seen in the, in the AIDS movement and what's happening, what are some of the lessons that we can take from the AIDS movement and apply them to, um, to the COVID, uh, uh, AIDS response, COVID response, rather, sorry. Maureen, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I want to um, encourage folks, if you have questions or thoughts, to put them in the chat. Um, and, and certainly you all are in community, so there are other spaces for dialogue um, as it continues. But I, I do also um, really want to turn to to Joya. Um, it was a pleasure to be with you yesterday and then to ride home with your book. Um, and 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 to be engaged with these ideas of solidarity based responses and the racism of pandemic preparedness and responses as as it's being enacted and or this is structural violence of some of these approaches so um i want to give you a chance to to give your thoughts as well thank you emily and i apologize i'm not going to turn my video on because i am driving and i was going to pull off the road and then i thought i wanted to make a brief point about where I'm driving to, which is Immokalee, Florida, um, home of one of the worst parts of our American COVID pandemic. And those on the front lines are often undocumented people, farm workers, and Partners in Health was invited by um, a consortium of organized farm workers called the Coalition of Immokalee Workers um, to help them with the community-based kind of solutions that we have uh, been involved with for now more than 30 years. And, you know, I think it's really quite remarkable that, you know, three of the people who have led this work for Partners in Health, two are graduates of our master's program, Dr. Frené Leon and Dr. Jude Beauchamp, and I think at least Brene may be on this call, and also Dr. Dan Palosuelos, who was, uh, you know, involved in founding our work in Mexico uh, with communities and the public sector. And so, you know, I think what we've learned from this is that there are, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday in class, but there's different kinds of representation. And I think you know, we have in our program and at PIH over many years talked about sort of identity politics, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, and as I think about that in, in, the, in your discussions of representation and in our focus on decolonizing global health or decolonizing healthcare in general, um, I really think of these kind of three areas where we need to have representation and one is simple and the other two are not. Uh, the simplest one is the representation of just who it is, you know, who's got a seat at the table and that's where identity politics sometimes can go awry as you rightly said. You can have, you know, a quota for women and have, you know, very 
right wing or non representational women um, and just tick that box. It is still important, I would say, to have gender diversity or racial diversity, but they're not equal. So the second, and I think a lot of what you're giving uh, us with your stories and particularly um, of your stories of African activists who themselves are living uh, with HIV are really the representation of experience, um, the, the decolonizing of experience so that trying to get what it is. And, and I think that we uh, encourage in our master's program and in our department of social medicine uh, that that experience should come from the affected, but also can be gleaned by social sciences, by deep reading of history, by doing really comprehensive ethnographies, uh, by understanding society at large. Um, and as you were describing your work on this book, it was 15 years of ethnography. So we're representing not just a person's face, the color of their skin, the gender, but in fact, uh, the lived experience. And then the third thing, and I think the hardest thing to do, um, but something I have learned from my Haitian colleagues, I have learned from HIV activists, is decolonizing or representing a different kind of work going forward. And we shared a little story yesterday with the students that the, the involvement I've had and certainly others as well in the AIDS movement and the COVID movement for um, COVID vaccine equity is really what do I have to bring to the table which is equal and necessary to what someone else has to bring to the table. That it's not that because I'm the doctor, I know everything. It's because I'm the doctor, I can have a specific role to play. And Paul Davis as an activist has another with a great, great kill game, as we say, and Maureen uh, being proximate to her colleagues and comrades in Malawi has a different piece of experience. So I think sort of, deconstructing the hierarchy that got us into this trouble uh, is really important. And so, you know, on my way to Immokalee, I'm reflecting on this and how beautiful that solidarity of our Haitian colleagues who have studied at Harvard, who have the lived experience in Haiti, in Liberia, in Rwanda, Burundi, and elsewhere, actually standing side by side with farm workers and trying to have a broader table with also some amazing public sector folks who work at a federally qualified uh, health center. So, you know, I, I decided not to pull off the road because I don't want to be late for that meeting of the minds um, that, that we're having at 1.30. But also to say this work is really ongoing. And I feel like what gives me hope is that we've all learned a very different structure of operating through our work, through our research, through our writing. And I just want to thank you for this really, really expansive book and the, you know, really looking under the hood and and as you were saying to our students you know history before the announcements uh of the bush administration and then just like the last thing i want to say again that i said in class but i often think about this uh, famous sort of description of the truth by um heschel uh, the Jewish uh, philosopher thinker, which is that the truth is really like a lantern that has many sides. And so there are so many different paths and ways to reveal and look at the truth and understand it. The truth is still singular, it's still there, but there are many lenses. And I think you're giving us such a fascinating lens and one that for many of us has just been a privilege to be part of it and also to you know to hear about your writing so i'll stop there joya thank you so much i just realized i haven't been muted so i have recess happening outside my so you might have child noise um i love that you're driving i i think it's 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 metaphor and practice all in one we're, we're all moving we're all moving as we're trying to learn from what we've done and and moving towards what needs to happen next um and and i wonder if there are folks that want to add to the conversation at this point with questions thoughts comments or interventions and scott i'm going to ask you to monitor and look at the chat 
absolutely on it. And so certainly folks, you know, if you have any questions, put them in through the Q&A option or you can do it through the chat as well. Uh, apparently, the chat, apparently the chat has been disabled. So now it's disabled. Uh, so it's Q and A, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Um, I will say that. Um, well, you know, one of the things that is that is complex, and one of the things that gives me a sense of urgency, and then a sense of gratitude about being in this conversation, is that. Um, and I'll sort of tell this by way of a story, but I hope it, I hope it lands correctly. Um, is when my, my book came out a month or two after um, Sarah Shulman's remarkable book, Let the Record Show, which is a history of ACT UP um, that, that ends in 1993. So it ends about, about three years before um, where my, this, this history of transnational activism um, begins. And I, and I went into the bookstore that had, had both of our books um, in my neighborhood because I, I was not actually at all chill about seeing my book in the window. And I was like, oh my God, my book's in your window. I'll sign the copies. And, uh -huh. and we were talking about it and they said, well, her book's about activism and your book's about Africa. Um, and, and I think that the, the sense of urgency that I have right now, um, and, the, and again, as I said, the gratitude about being in this conversation is in part because um, we have lived um, through the destruction, right? Of, of any faith in, in government action um, in the past, years uh, past and under the Trump administration. We've lived through a real, a period where it's very, very justifiable to be cynical about foreign aid and engagement in foreign aid mechanisms. And we're, the, we're again in a space where activism um, as, as um, direct action, intervention, protest um, is essential. Um, and at the same time with the, the wheels turning with these global um, preparedness councils, the global threat council, the treaty, um, if we don't see those interventions of activism, um, we, we all ought to be quite afraid um, of what's going to happen. Um, Joan Kaufman has a question. I often wonder, having worked on HIV AIDS globally myself and the hard won TRIPS agreement on health emergencies, why are we not requiring Moderna and Pfizer and other vaccine manufacturers to share their manufacturing tech with what's my view on that? I mean, my view on that is that is that it's it's medical apartheid. It's vaccine apartheid all over again. And and that what is astonishing, no, it's not astonishing. What you see is the power of, and I'm going to borrow this from Joya. We were talking yesterday, but of, of authoritarian capitalism. And what you th see is is the ability when you break through a flank, when you bring the drug prices down, when you get the trips to look at the flexibilities for international for antiretrovirals that the flank closes, right? That you have a victory that doesn't, um, that doesn't translate into a new compact and a new approach. And that right now what we're seeing where lack of access to vaccines is gonna perpetuate this pandemic everywhere and the economic impacts everywhere, including on the capitalist entities um, who are driving this inequity. And so it's, it's really, it's, it's a death spiral in a way. That's my, my view on that. Um, Byron, good. This has been absolutely terrific. I just read things, but thanks, Byron. Wonder if you all could talk about more about the emerging structure of activism, humanitarian organizations, etc. Are we in a different place today? All of this, of course, is profoundly important to what we mean by social medicine, including within the context of our department. So I'm going to say, I know I also have to end perfectly on time, so I'm going to say a minute, and then I'm going to give Maureen a minute. Um, and, and that is to say something I said, I said yesterday um, in class as well, it is less safe than it used to be to do the kind of activism that we did to bring, um, to bring drug prices down. Um, at one point when the target was Al Gore and the Clinton Gore US Trade Representative's office that was strong arming the South African government because it had a law that gave it the right, the, the Access to Medicines Act that gave it the right to um, obtain medications um, through compulsory licensing and through parallel importing, um, activists climbed a tree and then climbed into the window of the US Trade Representative's office to take it over. If you did that today, particularly if you were black or brown person, you would be shot. Um, all of these protests that we're going to now have spatial recognition software. 
our phones are tracked, our social media is under surveillance. So there was surveillance, there was surveillance even then, absolutely. Um, but we are in a different space when it comes to the kinds of um, the trail that's following people that do activism. Um, and so I think that that is something we're all thinking about um, as we seek to um, resist, consolidate power and react. Um, so, so I think I'll say that. And then also just that I do think this idea that there is a dichotomy, it's not an idea, it's, it's systematized in the, in the National Security Council right now where you have two health focus positions, one on health security and one on humanitarian issues. That dichotomy is, um, is, is um, again, it's, it's almost going to be lethal. Maureen, any, what, what would you say? Where are we today? I don't think if I have any responses to that, but I think for me, uh, I think what I would say is um, any activism, uh, any community act act activism, I think should be informed by uh, what does the community want, right? You know, uh, you know, are the programs or uh, the agendas, right? Uh, objectives that are being advanced, are they really responding like to, uh, to, the, to the community needs? I think that's how I'd respond, but I think you've uh, kind of like comprehensively responded to that, Emily. But I wanted, if you can allow me, I wanted to, uh, you know, touch on, I think what, uh, what uh, Joya said, uh, I think which you started in the beginning around like transnational activism. Uh, and I think why that is important. I think maybe that could also apply to the, uh, to the question that, you know, um, that uh, Bailon asked uh, to say, I think what has also kind of like made this, you know, activism, this movement live, I think it's that transnational, you know, you know, component, you know, whereby we have, uh, you know, um, civil society or communities from the global south, like that are living in the moment that are out there, you know, that, you know, are closed to the context, right? To where, you know, things are happening. Um, and then you have, you know, civil society from the global north, right? Right in, uh, that have access to platforms where decisions are being made, right? Uh, and uh, I think like Emily, you know, was saying like a lot of, you know, the activism that happened in the US and all that, right? Which, you know, civil society from the global south, you know, had limited access to all those spaces, right? And I think what we have learned from the AIDS movement is that uh, I think in the AIDS activism is the importance, right? Of, you know, collaboration, that collaboration between the global south civil society and the global north uh, civil society and uh, in and in, and and just tapping you know civil society from the global uh, south tapping into the expertise of you know those from the global north and the civil society from the global north uh, from the global south they're bringing in the context and the expertise i think that's what you know has actually made you know this whole movement uh, and this whole activism uh, thrive that we have come together and i, I think we we are seeing i think some elements of that in the covid um activism as well, where we are seeing, you know, civil society from the global south and civil society from the global north kind of like, you know, working and pushing, you know, uh, for different advocacy agendas together. So I think I just wanted to expand on that because it's also, it's an approach that we are using in one of the programs that I'm working on and it's, 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 it's pretty much working well. Yeah, I know we're out of time, but I, I want to just also address uh, Byron because you, you know, your work in Indonesia and China and elsewhere has a very strong activist bent um, in terms of demonstrating what's needed. Um, certainly our department has a history of that, of where you have truth telling as an act of, of activism, but also, you know, this, I think, movement type work that we are students of, that we are learning from, it has tactics, it has strategy, and it has an outcome that can be measured. And my fear is that, you know, when we hear the deans, uh, you know, otherwise, like, very excellent state of the school, but the metrics that we're holding, you know, Harvard to are things like patents and who is creating a new company. And yet we know that without the social medicine approach, that will continue to exacerbate and even worsen, you know, the inequalities. And so we need to, as our, I would say, our department to say, push back a little bit on this sort of uh, market driven, you know, innovation is great, science is great, but 
if it's all the metrics are wrapped up in the market um, and discovery and not delivery and equity, then then I think Harvard is not uh, living up to what it could do. Those are my thoughts. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Scott, to wrap up. I know we're a little bit over time. Oh, but well, that was wonderful. And I was glad to have it go over time. Um, and we thank you very much for her, a wonderful talk. I can't imagine that anyone listening to this talk is not going to want to go out and read your book. Here, here it is again for everyone uh, who's watching it. And I, I have read it. It's, it's terrific. And uh, really the way that you, you place various forms of activism and various activities of activists uh, into, into this conversation, both historically and moving forward, really well done and greatly appreciated. So, so thank you very much. And certainly, Maureen and Joya, thank you so much for your, your commentary. Uh, this is really just a, a valuable past 75 minutes. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I see questions that are there that, that are really the questions we have to address for the future. Um, so let's leave them there and work on them. What, where, where are indigenous people in all of this? How can we use language differently? How can we um, build the new future with a language that, that continually has this ethics of starting the story with the activists and perhaps not with the president behind the podium. It is an absolute honor and privilege. So thank you, Scott and Joya and Maureen and everybody. Thank you all. The fight continues. <laughs>